Hello everyone and welcome to Workshop Wednesday. I'm Jeanette Mulvey, the Content Director at Co, a publication for small businesses from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We know this is a challenging time for small businesses. Our Workshop Wednesdays have been filled with ideas and inspiration to help keep your business running through this difficult time. Before we get started, I want to thank Dell Technologies for sponsoring today's event and helping us bring you this important information. Today, we're looking to the future and imagining what the workplace will look like and how your business will need to adapt. Our panel today has some great ideas and advice on how you can pivot your business. Audience, I'll be taking your questions, so be sure to ent enter them into the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you see a question that you like, be sure to click the thumbs up button. Our panel today includes Annie Eaton, CEO of Futurist, an Atlanta-based technology consulting firm, Kenny Nagayan, CEO of Baton Rouge, Louisiana-based creative agency 368, and Mobilaji Sokundi, head of strategic partnerships and center for entrepreneurship at Dell. Thank you all so much for joining. Kenny, I'm gonna start with you. You have been managing your team remotely since this has started, which was not typical for you. So tell us how it's changed, how you're managing your team and what you're learning from that. Yeah, right now has been a pretty darn good experience. You know, things have changed for us. Uh, for one thing, the frequency of communication has definitely Im increased a lot because, you know, people want clarity now more than ever because you live in a world where you get bombarded with content what the government's doing next. People just need to be very clear where we stand and where they stand for next steps. So the things that we've seen changes, you know, every week now our uh, HR manager, Teresa Jones, sends out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like an update on where we stand within the company and what changes to our work schedules are gonna happen or anything they should look for in the future. We try to be as like definitive as possible, but you know, it's a little difficult with like the uncertainty out there. But that's something they're certainly working towards. I'll tell you the biggest change that we've seen is the difference in meetings actually. And I'm sure other people have witnessed this as well, is that either your meetings have gone significantly up or they've gone down. And I say that, you know, I learned this from a, uh, a fellow CEO friend of mine that said, you know, meetings only happen when you don't communicate. And so I feel like right now, you know, are we structuring of meetings to be focused more on like, are we making a decision? Are we brainstorming? Or can we handle this on Slack? Defining this out loud and making sure people follow protocol before actually scheduling a meeting has been a really big difference maker in terms of productivity. Uh, luckily on our side, we've had less meetings, but it's it's been a it's been a pretty big change and a grateful change. Overall though, the one thing I think that will be the biggest shift uh, is the response to trusting teams to become more remote. Uh, I know a lot of managers struggle when they first shifted to remote to be like, can I trust my team? I don't know if they're gonna actually do stuff that I want them to do while they're gone. I see the shift to like, one, you have to trust your teams to be more remote because that'll be a baseline thing that people will expect when they come work for a company now. But also managers are just gonna hold their people more accountable. And this means like new measurement tools, tracking and expectation of results are gonna rise. So expect that gonna be the big lesson and the big change here is that managers are just gonna hold people more accountable. For the people that wanna be held more accountable, that's great. That's more development. For the people that hate that, Jeanette, you know, I mean, find somewhere else to work, you know? And that's kind of the cold hard truth is like, we're, we're having that rapid shift that's gonna come at a cost of accountability and expectation for employees now. Yeah, um, when you talk about meetings, you are saying basically set expectations and structure of the meeting in advance so everybody going yep. knows what the purpose of the meeting is, right? Yeah, and just be okay with people saying that I'm not gonna bring uh, any value to this meeting. So for us, it's plan, play, and problem solve. Those are the three categories of meetings that we have within our organization. And if it doesn't lie in any of those three categories, handle that on Slack or sure. handle that like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, 
you know, we don't want to do meetings for the sake of meetings. And I so, hope that doesn't change. <laughs> right. So that's plan, play, and problem solve. Is that what you said? Yep. Um, we stole that uh, framework from a mentor of mine named Michael Ventura from another agency. And we read that. It kind of just made sense. It's like, you know, you only really need meetings unless you're solving a problem. You're trying to brainstorm something or it's like a cultural meeting. But otherwise than that, you know, do we really need to meet? Can we solve this one on one right. or are we just not communicating well enough? Sure. Great. I'm going to jump to Annie. Um, Annie, I know you're in the same situation. You are managing a team remotely, which wasn't how you were doing things before. So how's that going? And um, what technology are you using and what are you learning from managing a remote team? It took a little bit of uh, getting used to it first, of course, but we have gotten into a, a smoother groove right now. Um, we had already used Teams, and I know this meeting is on Teams, so at least everyone who's on the call has it installed. Um, we were using that mostly just as a chat function before, and uh, we ended up actually completely taking on the majority of its functionality as far as a collaboration tool. Um, we were already using SharePoint Online, and it um, pairs very nicely with that. So as far as managing our files and the structure there, um, that has been extremely helpful. Uh, one of the things that we also are now using is Confluence for documentation. Um, we just started a new internal project, largely in part due to the fact that uh, several of the clients we had lined up for Q3 and Q4 this year, unfortunately, no longer have budget for emerging technology software development. So we had to get creative with how we plan on making money. Um, and so we are now developing our own project and doing all of our documentation in Confluence. But one of the things that I like to always look for when taking on a new technology, especially when it's for collaboration, is the integrations it has with the other software we're already using. So um, the fact that within Teams you can have these different tabs and um, display Trello or Confluence or um, Airtable or just all these other softwares that you might also be using is a really great um, great way to keep everything in one place so you're not just bouncing around between different softwares. Of course, look for the tools that are going to be right for the work you're doing, but also keep a big eye on how they integrate and how that can help you be more efficient instead of just scattered all over the place. Sure. Um, so that's that's what I would say there. Great, thank you. Mobilaji, I know Dell is all over this. So how are you anticipating workplaces are going to change and what kinds of technology needs are you hearing from small businesses right now? Yeah, Jeanette, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So, I mean, um, I mean, first of all, uh, small business will, um, business owners would reevaluate and amend their communication approach. Uh, we know that's going on right now, um, we, you know, we, um, talk to at least uh, thousands of small business owners every single day, right? You know, especially like, uh, you know, in the in the, in the COVID era, um, you know, phone calls and video conference platforms will replace face-to-face -face interactions. And of course, the expertise that certain uh, small business leaders possess, you know, to walk in a room and evaluate a situation uh, becomes a little more intricate for those leaders and their respective teams, right? Because, you know, the face-to-face -face interaction is gone. Um, as a result, the move or shift, you know, to walk from home or you know, remote work uh, dictates that small businesses we examine how they constructively stay connected and align with their staff. Um, I mean, secondly, uh, there will be a heavy reliance, uh, you know, just from you know the conversations we're having right now, and and, and uh, as we anticipate things, there will be a heavy reliance on various forms of virtual communication. Um, I believe Kenny talked about like you know the video conferencing piece earlier, but video conferences and and chat apps will help small businesses stay connected to their staff and teams and will gradually fill the void of the, the missing in-person discussions. Um, from a technology standpoint, you know, when we talk about needs, you know, to your, to, to your question, um, you know, small businesses, you know, uh, would need to deploy the fitting technology to maximize uh, remote work and keep teams connected. Um, getting a chance, you know, to um, access the, the roles within each business, understanding which roles can be transitioned to a more mobile setup, right? Um, you know, that's important. Ensuring that employees understand the simple setup of an uh, at home desk solution, that, that's, that's, that's absolutely important. But also um, understanding 
um, what the different uh, needs are, right? Because when you look at small businesses, right, they're different flavors, right? There's small businesses that play maybe like in a B&B space, maybe uh, like the hotel and lodging space. There's certain small businesses that play primar uh, primarily maybe like as creative professionals. Some small businesses are uh, maybe playing the engineering space. So understanding the list of applications that employees utilize and investing in business grade collaboration platforms, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams, and ensuring that you know they're part of the everyday way of communication with the employees outside of face to face is equally uh, important. So right, great, thank you. So Kenny, I'm coming back to you. Do you think that this shift to working from home is temporary, or do you think, as many say, we have embarked on the, the work from home era? I know Twitter this week said that its employees will be able to work from home forever now. Oh, forever. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? I do think it's. I mean, it's not like work from home is next. It's like, you know, how, the future of work is going to be work from home. And that's going to be a baseline expectation that companies will have to use to recruit the best talent. And it's not a temporary thing. I actually do see like it's going to be an interesting talent war because now small businesses and large businesses like just all of a sudden realize like, oh, yeah, we can recruit for like very similar talent. And like there's going to be some things that are going to change in the talent recruitment and retention game. One of the like things I'm a little bullish on is that you know if you're going to recruit best talent you know the people's home office is now going to be the place they spend the most at because people are going to be working from home and it's going to be important for companies to actually invest in like the neighborhoods that people live in so for example if you're like hiring employees in a big dense like in a neighborhood that has a big density of like the demographic that you're trying to actually recruit you know, having a meeting space or having come some kind of space that your brand can represent there is going to be very important. And that's why I think it's very important for leaders to really think ahead of time is that, you know, how can I create like physical spaces that can like live my my values? I mean, the one person that's already ahead of this is like Tony Shea from Zappos. I mean, he basically took over downtown uh, Las Vegas uh, doing that initiative. But, you know, I, I don't want to like leave this one point out too, is that there's crisis planning is going to be very important from here and like CEOs and human resources like have to be like be more jointly led than ever because you know this is not a temporary change this is going to be a here on out change and just because you know whether you're impacted positively or negatively by COVID-19 you know regardless is like people will expect you now to have learned some serious lessons from today and when the next epidemic pandemic or whatever happens they're going to expect you to implement those lessons pretty quickly. So simply put, like, you know, no one can have that aura of immunity just because you're, you survived COVID-19. So it's important to remember that, like, one, this isn't temporary. Two, I would crisis plan as much as possible now, just so you can prepare yourself for next. Like, it's the best time to debrief now and predict, like, what are some of the changes that will be here on forevermore? That's so important to do now as a team. Yeah. So speaking of that, Annie, I know that you you specialize in AR and VR, and those tools are now more important than ever because if businesses aren't able to be with their employees in person or their customers in person, that's what, really where AR and VR can be really helpful. So can you talk a little bit about that? What what tools you're using or you know of that small businesses could adopt now? Sure. Uh, so on the virtual reality side, and for people who are less familiar with that term, that is where you are wearing a headset. It's all encompassing of your vision and you're immersed in an environment that is digitally created. Um, with that, there were a lot of really amazing advances last year when the Oculus Quest headset was released. Um, it is one of the better, actually, if not best mobile VR headsets out on the market right now. And I think the price point is around $400 a unit, which is much lower of a price point than we had seen previously um, for such a quality experience. So luckily, the price point's driving down, which is going to make it more accessible to small business owners. Um, there are a lot of collaborative platforms out there um, for a few to mention, Altspace VR, Roomy, um, which Rumi is more focused on education and meetings. Um, and then now Immersed VR, which I sometimes use as a way to 
uh, block out all of these distractions around me and just focus on my desktop in front of me huge in VR. Um, there are so many great collaborative as well as focus tools that small business owners or any um, business people can utilize. Um, on the augmented reality side, I'd like to focus more on a very approachable way to start getting content out there in AR. So augmented reality is a digital overlay of um, of a model or some sort of content onto the physical environment. Usually you might see that through your phone or a pair of glasses, um, but with Facebook's new Spark AR, I guess it's come out uh, at least a year ago by now. It's a online tool that anyone can use for free to create your own AR content. Um, they even have some preloaded templates and it's actually how people are making Snap, uh, not Snapchat, sorry, Instagram and Facebook filters. So if your business page wants to do something creative to reach customer base remotely, uh, creating an AR filter might be a cool way to do that. And you can do that through Spark AR for free. Great, thank you so much. Well, Balaji, before we go to the Q&A, I have another question for you. And I guess you are you talk to small businesses all day long. So what are you hearing from them? What are their biggest concerns right now? Is cybersecurity a concern? And just generally, how is Dell aiming to meet those needs in terms of technology and this new work, remote work environment? Yeah, Jeanette, I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, right? Security is a huge concern, right? I think even before COVID-19, security has always been a concern. Uh, just to, you know, uh, p uh, share some uh, security uh, data points, you know, on average, and this is before uh, COVID-19, the average small business owner or small business gets breached, that gets breached, uh, loses an average of $32,000. And as we all know, right, a small business can't afford to lose that much. Uh, prior to COVID-19, there were more than 4,000 ransomware attacks every single day. That's prior to COVID-19. Also, one of the things I found out at Dell, just talking to small businesses and even medium businesses, is that 90% of small and medium businesses do not protect their data. This is before COVID-19. Now, you can now imagine that a number of the start points, right, have been further amplified in light of, you know, uh, COVID-19 taking place and a lot of small businesses now being worried about their data. So as more people rely on their personal Wi-Fi networks, it is more important than ever to ensure that every network is safeguarded from frequent online threats, right? Um, you know, at Dell, more than 65% of our global team works in a flexible capacity. So we have advanced insight in all areas of online security. And part of our mandate, you know, or conversations we constantly have every single day, including myself with our dedicated tech advisors at Dell, is that when they're having these uh, conversations with small business owners every single day, is to share with them tips or you know different measures they can take to make sure that you know they are protected so things as you know setting up a vpn right uh you know if you said if, if a small business is setting up you know their team to work remotely having a, a vpn is vital to keep your company data secure while allowing individual employees you know to access the company email files and um, other systems right um start using a firewall if working from home is a new reality, which it is for most small business owners in the States now, uh, uh, you know, relying on a firewall like SonicWall will provide high performance intrusion prevention, malware blocking, content and URL filtering and application control. Um, making sure that also um, the staff, you know, are, are well educated on all these measures, right? Making sure that they also, the second piece, making sure they also have the right work from home solutions. Um, gone are the days where when small businesses, Jeanette, engage us and just talk about, you know, like a, a need for a laptop or a desktop. The conversations that we're having right now, you know, with small business owners are around, you know, a solution, a work from home solution, right? So if we're talking to a financial planner, they're looking at a, a dual monitor setup, right? Because they want to make sure they can like access and, you know, see their data like all in, in one view, right? If we're talking to a creative professional, they want to make sure they have like a precision workstation, right? That can do that intense work. So the needs are, are really different, but security, as you mentioned earlier, is huge, but also having the right work from home solutions, Jeanette, is immensely important in, in the new world. We, we live in right now. Yeah. Do you think that employees, most businesses can get by with laptops for their remote employees, or do you think they need um, desktops? No, I mean, it, it takes more than that, right? It ultimately, it, it comes down to the business need, right, of, of uh, you know, or which kind of indus industry the small business is playing in, right? So if you talk about, like, you know, uh, someone, that, as I mentioned earlier, that's a financial planner, it would take more than, like, a laptop, right? Oftentimes, maybe they're looking for, like, maybe, like, a dual monitor display. And we had a ton of requests uh, uh, coming from CPAs, right? Tax season, right? Tax season was extended. So they're looking for, like, you know, more beyond just, like, a laptop to get things done quicker. When we're talking to, like, a, a designer or a 
like gamer or like you know, an interior designer, for instance, they're looking for like, you know, a system, right? That has like, you know, that power, you know, to, to kind of get a lot, a lot of work done, right? Something that has like Intel V Pro, right? Which also helps with uh, remote management. So ultimately it comes down to what the needs are based on the business, but it takes more than a laptop or even a desktop to get things done in the new, uh, new era we're in right now. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna go to Q&A now and Annie, I'm gonna come to you first. This person asks um, what tools you can recommend, either project management or otherwise, to help um, ensure employee productivity while they're working remotely. Yeah, so we are a big fan of Trello. I guess this is not so much, I mean, it is partially project management, but more so task management and ensuring all of my employees are clear on what tasks they need to complete. Um, if you haven't used Trello before, it's a very visual tool. So um, we typically uh, task out our list into different sprints every other week. We have goals that um, I can assign people to, I can assign different categories to, and uh, that also can upload photos. It's a, I guess, a great way to give visual feedback on what I like, what I don't like. Um, and so that's been a tool that we've been using a while now, and it's only gotten uh, better to use since we've been remote. Uh, people can check things off themselves, so I don't have to constantly micromanage them, which can sometimes be a challenge for people while working remotely, always wondering what your employees are doing. And the best part about it is I can assign things, they can um, manage and maintain their activity themselves, but I can see progress. So um, it puts a little more of that trust in them and lets them know that I I trust them to do these things. I know that they're going to be responsible, which I think goes a long way for them. But then I also get the feedback I need with them being able to take control of completing the tasks and documenting that themselves. Great, thank you. Kenny, um, this person is a startup and they are building a team from scratch and therefore needing to build a team from scratch remotely. So. Um, do you have any thoughts just about how do you hire remotely and manage new employees and onboard new employees remotely? Yeah, I think, you know, hiring like 101 is that, you know, you should have pretty clear like what a good employee for you looks like. So an example of that is, are they aligned to your mission, your values, and your purpose? You know, that's baseline stuff is that you should have that pretty much outlined when you go and like recruit in the beginning. Now, when you actually get down to the thick of it, I think there are important things too to think about such as, you know, when you bring them online, you know, are they able to communicate and have good communication habits that translate to remote? So are they using their, your name? Are they engaging you with questions? Like that's a lot of telltale signs on how they interact. Are they more of a talker or are they more of a listener throughout throughout the remote process? Uh, I say that if you're gonna hire someone remotely, which we are actually right now, have a very clear one pager on the most critical questions that you have to ask that reflect with the values that you expect that employee to exhibit. I mean, you also have to look for little things too, such as do they say the word we more than they say the word I? Do they have very specific anecdotes and very specific stories when they're answering your uh, hiring questions on their experiences? And furthermore, you have to be pretty tight on how you measure them as an employee. So we mentioned earlier about like the big shift on like managers trusting more is going to be, they're gonna hold their people more accountable. You should be pretty clear on how you want to hold that person accountable and they need to be clear on what they're signing up with as well regarding the onboarding process you know this is a, a very i mean everyone knows that onboarding is a very critical time for an employee's life cycle you know in that week they should meet as many people from the company as possible to make them feel integrated into the culture and that means like setting up like one-on-one -on -one coffee meetings, being able to have like an actual presentation that you can walk them through where they can ask questions, even before they actually come into the office for the first day, sending them a list of things that they should know about, you know, the people within the office. It's really important to make people feel like they're pretty much work, they like they're part of the team. We had an employee that just came on, I think right when COVID started. So it's pretty much like, you know, he just got thrown into the thick of it, poor Greg. And, you know, we, we do our best to make sure that he meets everyone within the company so that he feels like he's part of the team because everyone else had that chance. So it's really lock down your hiring process, align to your values, make sure onboarding everyone can meet someone as as possible so they can make those personal connections and be very clear on how you're being measured and how they are being measured. That's gonna, uh, that transparency will go a long way.
Yeah, thank you. Well, Balaji, I'm coming back to you with a tech question. Um, this person asks, what kinds of changes have companies been making in terms of digital document sharing and uh, tools for that and just automating workflows for document sharing? Have you seen that happening? And how well, are I mean, in the small business space, right, we haven't seen as much of that, right? Because I think, you know, um, I also get a chance to work with entrepreneurs, right? Who are a little bit ahead of this. I think that, you know, um, small businesses are gradually picking, um, you know, some of this uh, um, notations around document sharing. That's something that they have not been used to before, but we're seeing more of it, right? And, you know, what we're seeing more of it is that, you know, in smaller teams, you know, there's been like a lot of document uh, sharing actually through chat apps, funny enough, right? I said of the states, right? Like WhatsApp, for instance, is, is huge, right? I mean, having uh, lived in other countries, especially like in West Africa. And what we're finding out is that within small teams, right? A lot of small businesses in the States are actually using like, you know, platforms like, you know, like a WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook, you know, to actually share content, uh, to share information, um, you know, to, uh, you know, share uh, video uh, content, right? To share like even documents, right? Also, we're noticing uh, uh, along the lines of document sharing that, you know, another platform that's in, in, in use oftentimes is that, you know, people do use sometimes like, you know, Signal, right? So it's something that I, I believe small businesses are, are picking up. We see more of that going on in the entrepreneur community, within the startup community, but SBs are gradually like, you know, picking it up, picking it up and doing more of that. Great, thank you. Um, Annie, this person asks, what is, your take on the future of VR, and I would say for our purposes, you know, specifically how VR in terms of how small businesses might be able to use it. So I think that one of the biggest things that's going to be uh, affected out of all of this is more focus on virtual meeting tools in virtual reality. Um, while we are having a great time here over video today, um, that is still not quite as personal of a connection, in my opinion, as being in a room with someone in virtual reality, where you have 3D space, you can walk up to people, you can actually have separate conversations with members of the meeting, uh, depending on where you're standing in the room, just like you would in real life. Um, it's actually quite exciting to me, and uh, I've I've gotten to experience it a bit myself, so I'm, I'm extremely excited on how that's going to impact the future of work. Um, and I think that will also be a great way to reduce the amount of travel that's required for business. So I don't think it's something that's going to happen overnight, but I do know of several companies that are really working hard on creating the best platforms for facilitating those types of meetings and events uh, in VR, and that's that's probably coming down, down the road pretty quickly. So keep an eye out for that. Great, thank you. Kenny, uh, you and I talked the other day and I said, what is going to happen to all of these empty offices? And you had some thoughts on that. This person asks, what do you think the future of the physical office environment is? Yeah, I think a lot of us can agree on that physical offices will become more communal space that's conducive to like remote working interactions. So you'll see like the private office kind of go away a little bit more and there'll be more open spaces where people can interact and collide. Um, what I worry about the, with that though, is that we might go back to a weird meeting um, interaction uh, culture where you know, they say remote best practices are when someone's remote, everyone's remote on their calls. I hope uh, just because we're back in the office that still continues. But I expect private offices to dwindle down. Uh, there'll be more communal space. But I also believe that your office spaces, though, will start becoming meeting spaces for communities. And that's going to be used as like a talent, almost like a marketing tool. I mean, we kind of do that with ours already at our office is that we previously right before COVID was that we let our office be used for the community to gather um, for like organizations like you're not alone, like a mental health organization. We find that if your office can be a space where people can like have great ideas, can collide together and come up with like new ideas through like interactions, that's the real purpose of the office in the first place. And I, I see that that's going to be the one from here for like for a long time coming. The one thing that this is more opinion than fact is that I see co-working spaces are going to be either rented altogether by larger companies as they're already built together to be collaborative with like not as many private offices. And I do see co-working spaces as an extra service uh, becoming more consultants for companies to create more collective space. So TLDR, it's one, private offices go down with collaborative spaces going up. Two, your office will become more meeting spaces. And three, uh, 
look for co-working spaces. I think that's going to be a great place, and I don't know how they're going to handle leases. I think that will be a place where companies will go towards to just rent out all right together. And in response, co-working spaces will have more uh, consulting revenue line streams coming up. Great. Thank you. Well, Balaji, this is um, a question that I think a lot of people can relate to right now, which is how do you overcome technological issues with your employees when your employees are essentially their own IT person now um, and you're reliant on their, you know, internet connection and their internet, their Wi-Fi speed and, you know, what is Dell advising people to do in terms of how to handle all of this stuff with people working from home? You know, uh, Jeanette, that's a great question, right? Uh, and frankly, um, that that um, that existed even before COVID nineteen, right? Um, you know, that that has always been in place where you know we, you're talking to a small business owner that has like five employees, they can afford the uh, the additional cost, right, to hire like an IT person, and so maybe they rely on a family member for the IT advice, and they don't necessarily get the advi uh, best advice. Now, in COVID nineteen, now uh, coming into the picture. Uh, there, more of that is going on. And so, I mean, what I always share with small business owners, right, and over the past, you know, few years, you know, um, talking on behalf of Dell Technologies at different events and more than ever before, is that, you know, in the States, right, Dell has at least 500 dedicated tech advisors, right, in the States that can have those conversations. So instead of a small business owner relying on um, uh, a family member or like a loved one or a friend for a tech advice, they can, you know, come to Dell and have that conversation and at no cost, right? And we have those tech advisors that can have those conversations like 12, 13, 14 hours a day, and we're doing it right now. Whereby we can have a conversation with them around their security needs, okay? Um, okay, are they, are they looking at IoT? Um, I know like, you know, um, Annie talked about AR, VR. We're getting AR, VR questions right now, whereby we have to connect them with our precision workstations team, uh, our mobile uh, our commercial team, right? So, we have the team right now to have those conversations whereby they don't have to rely on a family member. Because I think one of the one of the um, uh, most concerning things a small business owner could do right now is to get a tech advice for someone that is not equipped, you know, to offer that advice, right? Just because, you know, we've seen like a, an uptick in, in ransomware attacks, in, in malware attacks, you know, so um, the, the best answer to that is, you know, reach out to, to, to Dell Technologies. We have at least 500 tech advisors based in the state to so have those conversations with you, whether by Zoom, whether by Skype, by Microsoft Teams, and we can walk you through that whole process of what you need to do to take care of your small business. And again, that comes at no cost. We're doing that right now. So thank you. So uh, two, uh, two follow ups on that. The, uh, someone else is asking about recommendations for Wi-Fi connection speed and strength, which I don't want you to give right now. But would those Dell advisors be able to give that kind of advice? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we, yes, we can have those conversations, right? I mean, Wi-Fi speeds also depends on like, you know, what other uh, what other things are going on in the house, right? So I find out, you know, now I think everything is fine so far. I think everyone can hear me clearly right now, right? I have three kids in the house. I've noticed that, you know, my my connection gets a little bit like, you know, funky when I have all three kids on their tablets, right? Yeah. So we need to understand, I mean, all, every situation is different, right? So we need to kind of get a sense of, okay, what, do, what a small business owner is working on? What is their staff working on? What kind of content are they sharing? Are they streaming information? Are they streaming content, right? So we can have those conversations to have, uh, we can have those conversations around technology on every aspect on anything, right? Um, as an example, Jeanette, I had, um, I had, um, a, a small business owner reach out to me and say, Mobileig, what, what is what, what what is VPN? Right, something that's basic. Right, we felt like you know folks reach out to us and say, hey, how do I set up a dual monitor? And we've literally had to like you know conduct like Zoom uh, our, our Zoom calls, right, whereby we actually showed and demoed how to set up uh, a dual monitor display with a docking station. Folks have access. What is a docking station? Right. So um, yes, we can have every kind of a sort of conversation around technology. Absolutely. Um, someone is asking, how do they get in touch with those Dell advisors? Yeah, so the, the wonderful thing about this is that we do have a partnership with the USC, so the US Chamber of Commerce, um, you know, whereby, you know, on the landing page, we do have like, you know, a 100 number where they can reach out to us. Uh, they can also like reach out to me directly, uh, mobileig.sukumbi at dell.com to initiate that conversation. But like I said, on the US Chamber of Commerce site, right, we also have a contact information where they can call us directly and talk to a dedicated tech advisor, not to like, you know, someone that, you know, uh, you know, they expect to call them back later. So that's the best way to reach out to us um, and we can have those conversations with them right now. Great. Thank you. Annie, how can managers 
manage employee burnout, their own burnout, and create some kind of boundaries between work and home life with all of their staff working remotely. Yeah, this one has been a learning curve for us as well. Uh, I think when we started this, everyone was in pretty good spirits. Everyone was excited to work in their sweatpants and then it kind of went down a little and we had to course correct. Um, I would say as far as burnout, something that's been extremely helpful for our team has been uh, this internal project. So while we're dedicating a lot of time to it in addition to our client work, even if it's just a really small project that you can think of for your employees to really take ownership of and have control over, I think uh, having that control is something that has been very helpful to my team, something that they really can make decisions on and, and it's, it's theirs and they have a piece of them in it, but it's also something that we're doing together. Um, that's kind of kept, kept people running, kept, kept people excited. Um, as far as work-life boundaries, I mean, we all are very close in my office. There's only 10 of us, so um, pretty small team that's physically in the office typically. Um, and we're very used to keeping up with each other, eating lunch together. And um, that was something that was actually bleeding over into our meetings because we weren't having that outlet. So what we did was have a standing um, optional meeting. It's a, a team's call every day around lunchtime and people can just pop in and pop out and say hi and catch up personally um, so that it doesn't bleed into the meetings. Um, we've also said the guidelines in the office are get your work done, um, attend meetings and be responsive. But if you would prefer to work outside of typical business hours, if that's what works for your family and for you and your mental health, that's OK. As long as you do those three things, keep up with uh, attending meetings, be responsive and do your work, then we're OK. So I am putting a lot of trust in them but they have also in turn proven that they can be trusted and still produce great quality of work with those parameters in place. So something I'll definitely continue to do as we move back into an office setting. Great. Um, Kenny, what are your thoughts about how to develop a work from home policy once things go back somewhat to normal um will it just be whoever wants to work from home can or some days in the office just how are you thinking about that yeah we're actually in the thick of this right now um because we found that like half the staff wants to go back to the office and in a weird way like actually most of them are parents and we find that parents have a really hard time focusing at home when you have multiple children. The other half are people that are like, I love doing this, we'll continue it forever. I mean, we're looking at ways where one, like you mentioned already, the office would be a communal space rather than just like a mix of private offices and then the, you know, mixed use. Uh, for us, as we're going through this, we figure out one, you know, what are days that we can come in together as a team where we'll all be together. Because I do believe that, you know, we want to go fully remote where every day we're remote, we still want to be together. So being very clear on that is number one, is like what days we're going to go in together. Number two is that we still want to make sure that people still follow great meeting protocols. So for example, this meeting, you know, it's only beneficial if we're all remotely on the screen, the square, to, like individually. If you have multiple people on screen and then you separate that, side conversations happen, you can miss really great conversation uh, points that happen when people are next to you. We want to keep that con communication very consistent. But the most important thing here, though, is like understanding that when working from home is that, you know, the policy here is that you're still responsible for getting your stuff done. And so you're going to be responsible for really tracking your time, logging your hours and making sure that you're responsible for deliverables that you're going to do. It's all the same things that we're going through right now, but being able to outline it and actually work it in a person's job description is going to be very important and making sure that you carry over the good habits that you have right now. Out of all this though, make sure that you wrap it all together in a place where everyone can find and reference when they need to. That's just great comms right there. Great, thank you. Mobilaji, I have a few questions here about um, technology and just getting it to and from employees once, you know, when they should, should employers be giving remote employees the company owned equipment to use or should they let them use their own personal equipment? And then if it's company owned, how do they go about getting it back and forth? Should they just be mailing it or do you have any insights into how businesses are handling that? Well, um, to, to, to the, um, 
to the first question, I would say that if a small business owner is able to pass on company owned equipment, I think that's preferred simply because, you know, if you rely on your um, employees to use their own, right, the, the employees equipment might not be up to par, right, to do the things that a small business owner needs done, right? So for instance, if you work with a company, maybe like an architecture firm, right? Where they do use maybe like a CAD software, or potentially maybe some of them might use SolidWorks. Um, an employee might not have um, a, a system, right? Capable enough, you know, to run some of this application. So again, I'll put that on, on, the, small, on, on the small business owners, right? That's one. Two, um, it really depends on the state. I think that in terms of like, you know, shipping and how you move products around, um, I know that a lot of states in the South, right, they're much more leeway around maybe like, you know, uh, this sort of like, you know, face-to-face -face interactions now, of course, with a with a mask, right? Uh, we're seeing less of that maybe like in states like New York, where, which is, which was the epicenter of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So uh, it really depends on the state, right, regarding the whole movement piece. I do know that at Dell, we've had no issues in terms of getting products out, you know, to uh, small business owners or the employees, right? So recently, the Nashville Entrepreneur Center uh, reached out to us and said, hey, Mobileye, all our staff, you know, they need to work remote. And, and their technology cannot fulfill our needs. So we need like a new set of like, you know, systems and, and, and laptops and, and hardware that can fulfill the needs of what we do at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. So we literally had to like, you know, um, you know, get those um, products to them within like a week, a, a week, right? And we had to ship to, to the employees directly, right? So um, it, it ultimately depends on the region folks are located and the business practice. But to your earlier question, absolutely. I would employ and implore the small business owners to make sure they they, they, they pass on or hand over their own uh, um, systems, you know, to their employees and their staff. Great, thank you. Annie, I think we have time for one more um, and I'm gonna come to you. Uh, do you have any insights into how physical offices, when employees do, some employees do return to work, how companies are going about changing physical office setups and whether the open office is finally dead, which I think a lot of people will say is a silver lining of this pandemic. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we do have um, part of our office that is more open. It's actually where the developers sit and currently they their desks, which they are not sitting at, are uh, very close together. We have these kind of quads where the desks are all combined. They do have a, a partition between them for just privacy and focus, but it is something that we are now having to change. So um, coincidentally, this week I've actually been discussing with our um, furniture supplier, another small business owner here in Atlanta on what we can do. And so we're separating all of those desks, um, ensuring that everyone has an appropriate amount of distance. Um, another thing that we are having to focus on, and this is probably because we're more tech focused and we build a lot of apps and programs that have to be used on varied devices is ensuring that the devices are sanitized between testing. Um, something we did on the VR side, and I know I mentioned earlier the Oculus Quest headset, um, because of its affordability, I've actually purchased one for all of my employees so they can have their own headset um, and use that so there's no transition, but for when we do have to share headsets or other devices, um, there are completely sanitized ways to do that. Uh, even in VR, a lot of people think it goes on your face, but there are aftermarket um, faceplate replacements by a company called VR Cover that you can actually wipe down their vinyl and their for use um, specifically for sanitation. So we're we're keeping an eye out on that, getting creative, and then ensuring that if a device is passed between members of my team, there's always a way to wipe it down and make sure it's completely clean. Great, thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. So first of all, thanks to the three of you. To the audience, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our sponsor, Dell, for helping us bring you this important information. Co will be back with a new event series soon. So keep your eye out for registration information. In the meantime, check out our site, growwithco.com. You'll find a range of great content aimed at helping your business survive the pandemic. And we'll get through this together. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Take care.